This is your library. This is the Library of Congress. It is also the largest library in the world. I would like for people that visit the African and Middle Eastern Division of the Library of Congress to walk away first with an incredible sense of pride, a sense of ownership, and a sense of belonging. I want them to understand that the collections that exist here capture and reflect the beauty of one of the most misunderstood but most remarkable parts of the world, Africa and the Middle East, that they are able to enjoy in our collections. Again, the histories, the cultures, the beauty, the depth, the diversity of the communities that make up those places and to connect those histories to their own. In 2008, in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the publication of Chinua Achebe's groundbreaking novel, Things Fall Apart, we established conversations with African poets and writers, a national program and an accompanying digital archive showcasing prominent literary figures throughout the continent, including among them Chinua Achebe, Ama Ata Aidu, and Gugiwa Tiongo Ali Mazuri, Karepse Kigotzitzile. And today, as part of this series, I am here with world renowned, award winning author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, whose novels, essays, and public commentary have been sampled in popular music, translated into over 30 languages, and celebrated the world over. Her TED Talks, The Danger of a Single Story, we sh and We Should All Be Feminists, have nearly 40 million views, millions of social media followers, and more clicks, likes, and shares than any of us can easily count. She is arguably the most influential African writer of our time. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, welcome to the Library of Congress and to the Conversations with African Poets and Writers series. How are you? <laughs> Thank you, Lanisa. Thank you very much. I am, I am well. I am as well as I can be. And it's lovely to be having this conversation with you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And glad to know that you are well, particularly on the heels of publication, of publishing a book, Notes on Grief, a provocative meditation on a very personal experience of loss. It is in many ways, both your own story, but also a story I think that so many of us can relate to following this past year of the pandemic. There's an interesting comment that you made not too long ago in an essay. You said, I am a person who reads and thinks and forms my opinions in a carefully considered way. And in the opening chapter of your book, Notes on Grief, you wrote in response to learning about the passing of your father, I came undone. I came undone. And in many ways, it prompts the question, what is it like to balance grief in a very public way for a person like yourself who seems in so many ways, as you put it, very carefully considered and measured in your approach. Mm. Ooh, I feel like you started with the best. Um, and I wish I, had, I wish I had a carefully considered response to that. <laughs> um, I've never, I think grief is, is an emotion that until my father died, I hadn't quite um, understood, experienced, grappled with the complexity of it. And so it left me um, not just emotionally undone, but in terms of language, it left me confused. It left me um, lacking in a way that I have never felt lacking in my life. And I also think that grief, um, you know, grief, grief remakes you, I think, right? So I, I feel remade. And so, yes, I do 
in general, approach life in a way that um, I like to think of as carefully considered because I'm a person who has loved reading from the time that I was you know, I don't know, three years old and also thinking and learning. So, so in general, my approach to life is that I want to know, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm always thinking about what I'm yet to learn. And I'm always knowing that, that knowledge can be revised, right? But I, but I also feel quite fiercely independent in my thinking. But all of those things kind of fell apart in the face of grief. Mm -hmm. And I remember once thinking to myself that grief makes one unreasonable. You know, grief, grief dislodges you from reason because, because so many of the things that I felt, I think a part of me kind of knew this is not reasonable. You know, the kind of rage that I felt, um, the way that I was so angry with people who meant well. You know, sometimes people would say um, kind things, well-meaning, condolences, but my response would just be this incredible anger. <laughs> um, and, and I knew that that was not reasonable, but I think it's all part of the process of grieving. I think grief is such a complex, such an emotional, and in some ways, such an unsayable thing. I, I don't know that we really have the language to completely grasp the complexity of it. It's been more than a year since my father died. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't been quite a year since my mother died. And both of those things have remade me. And so there are moments when I, okay. And then there are moments when I completely disintegrate emotionally. And even that continues to surprise me, you know? So, so, um, so I think I would say that this is the first time in my life that I have had to um, make peace with the fact that one cannot always be careful, carefully considered. <laughs> Some things just completely remake you and, and just, you know, some things are so catastrophic that you become another version of yourself. You know, it's, it's interesting that you would touch on grief in the way that you've just done. In the book, you write, grief is a cruel kind of education. Mm -hmm. And you speak about the inability of language, the incapacity uh, uh, of language to capture the full essence of your feelings. And I couldn't help but to think of the late, great Chinua Achebe, who wrote about the power and the importance of language in his work, in his critical work. And there's this moment where you turn to your mother tongue and find in your mother tongue a comfort that cannot be captured in English in the same way. Can you speak a little bit about the power of the mother tongue, particularly as a critical tool of articulation, of use, of expression, of understanding within the corpus of African literature. I think one of the things I feel really grateful for um, is, is being bilingual and, um, and having this very strong sense of connection to my, my culture, to my language, to being an Igbo woman in many ways. And I say that um, also acknowledging that, that I, I obviously I don't think Igbo culture is perfect. There's a lot that I quarrel with <laughs> in Igbo culture, and we can talk about that later. But I, but I feel very grateful that I was raised in this culture, that I speak this language. And, and English is also a language that I have loved my entire life. English for me was the language of education. Um, in some ways, the language of written literature. And Igbo for me was the language of emotion and the language of laughter and the language of family and close friends. Mm -hmm. And so I remember growing up, we would speak both languages at home, often at the same time. And sometimes just because English didn't quite capture the complexity of something, once would switch to Igbo. And in the face of grief, I realized that the, really that the only thing that the, in, in terms of language and in terms of how I felt about um, people giving me condolences and being kind. The, the one word that was not as, um, that, did, that did not bring about a kind of prickliness from me as much as the others was simply that word in Igbo, ndo. And ndo is difficult to translate in this context because on the surface, ndo is sorry. But, but when it's said in the, in the face of grief, it actually, it, it's much more than just sorry. It's a kind of acknowledgement. In some ways, it's I see you. 
and I acknowledge what you're feeling. And I might not know exactly what it is, but I acknowledge it. And, uh, you know, and I found, I just found a kind of comfort in that. But also I think in a larger sense, um, Igbo ideas of mourning, which initially I was very resistant to mm -hmm. because, um, because funerals are really celebrations of life when an elderly person dies. And when my father died and we had to make arrangements for the funeral, I was so resentful <laughs> of the fact that suddenly we had to turn to hosts, right? I thought I am immersed in my pain. I do not care about who's going to be given rice and who's going to be given a goat and who needs to be given a cow. But when we finally had the funeral, I found it so beautiful, the sense of the communal, mm -hmm. right? the sense that it wasn't just that we had lost our father, it was also that the community had lost its son. And so all of these people gathered in our house, the different groups would come, there was dancing, I found myself dancing. And not only did I find myself dancing, I found it comforting. And I was quite taken aback by this because my more rational self had really resisted this. I thought, you know, I, I do not see why um, dancing has to be a way of expressing my grief, but I actually found it just, just the idea of vocalizing that grief, dancing, holding my father's photograph and calling out my father's name and my father's titles, um, I found so comforting. And again, I think it's all connected with language, right? Because I'm holding that and I'm saying, oh, no, na mo, na America, na mo de Laura. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's um, mm -hmm. at the risk of sounding a little precious, there was something almost um, both mystical and magical about it. Mm -hmm. You know, your response, it, it just immediately makes me think of that moment in the book when you talk about ancestral land mm -hmm. and that ancestral land is really also about storytelling, about stories. Mm -hmm. And so by extension, also about communities, the people who have walked before us, who walk with us now and who will walk after we have transitioned on. Can you, can you just elaborate a little bit on the power and importance of ancestral land. You know, it's interesting that you say that because actually in, in just talking about this, the funeral, what I also um, wanted to say is, I think one of the reasons I found it so beautiful is that it, it felt very much as though I was part of this, um, a, a part of a continuous, process and um, that I was doing something obviously in slightly um, changed forms that the people before me had done and that hopefully the people after me would do mm. and also I think there was something about um, you know hopefully committing my father's spirit his gentle beautiful mm. kind spirit um, to the to this kind of longer ancestry of my grandfather, who also, from the stories I'm told, was a, a lovely, kind, and gentle man, and to his father, who, you know, so that, that for me, was quite moving. Um, ancestral land, and I, I write in the, in the book about um, what was going on during the period just before my father died, which is that we had a, um, <laughs> a man who was very wealthy, who was from, who's from mm -hmm. the town next to ours, and who wanted to take away my, um, villages ancestral land and how this was such a, a deeply contested issue and i think looking from the outside it can be easy to misunderstand and wonder why it's such a big deal it's a piece of land really nothing is on it but but land is so central to Igbo culture and to our sense of self and and the deity of the land is um, in traditional Igbo religion ana which is the land, the deity of the land is kind of, is, is the central deity in people's lives, which is why in the mornings, um, sacrifices are, are offered to the land. You know, the, you sort of hope that the land will bless you, that kind of thing. And obviously we're all now mostly Christian, but there are things that remain and that, that kind of veneration for ancestral land and land that is owned in a communal way, which is also important, I think. I mean, obviously there's mm -hmm. land that's owned individually, um, but, but that piece of land is communal land. It belongs to the community. And so it then becomes, I think also, I could even argue becomes a metaphor for um, identity, for history, 
because you're holding on. You're holding on to it because your great, great grandfathers owned it and passed it on. And, um, you know, so I think my father was very invested in that, in what was going on at the time, because he felt so strongly that it was just unjust to try and take from a community. You know, I can't help but to think now of this moment in the book where you you write about your staple uniform during the pandemic, your house dress, lying on the floor and it later becoming a joke, a running joke in the family that your brother um, would, would pull out for laughter. And in a way, as you talk about metaphor, I can't help but to think that your house coat on the floor, your stable uniform during this particular season is also a sort of metaphor, if you will, for your sort of exposing yourself in a very intimate way mm -hmm. through this book. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded that grief is in some ways a recurring theme in, in much of your work. I mean, it's there in Purple Hibiscus, of course it's there in Half of a Yellow Sun, it's a, it's a recurring theme, but this, this is different. This is, again, we're shifting out of the imaginative realm and into the real lived experience, which help, you know, it makes me wonder the vulnerability, the vulnerability again of perhaps on one end coming undone, but also exposing yourself, exposing yourself in a way where people can see you, yes, as irretrievably human, I think you've once said, but also um, tangibly human. You know that 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 you know we you, a relatable uh, experience, particularly during the pandemic. So, can you talk a little bit about vulnerability? Did you did you have reservation? Did you did you think for a moment? I don't know if this is what I want to publish at this time, or were you prepared to just again hold on to those vulnerabilities and share them openly with all of us to see? Oh, Lisa, I just, I just, I think it's so lovely this, um, what you've, this metaphor of exposing oneself, and it's just made me really think, and I, it's, I find it so beautiful, so thank you. And I think you're right, I think that, um, that this, this book, which really, I mean, it's, it's an essay, I think it's the first time that I have, um, opened myself up in the most, um, I think the most honest um, and the most, um, in some ways there's a kind of radical, the, the kind of radical honesty that I, I like to think that I bring to my fiction and never bring to my own life because, because my, my instinct is always to self-preserve. Um, so when I, in general, when I write nonfiction, when I write memoir pieces, I'm always very self-conscious. I'm thinking about protecting myself primarily, <laughs> but I'm also thinking about protecting the people I love. Um, and so when I write about, about my family or my friends, it's, it's never quite, it's not that I lie because, you know, in general, I try not to, but it's that I, it's that I'm measured. Um, but when it comes to fiction, I, I feel, and this is why I think that fiction is, is the world in which I'm most comfortable because fiction is, is obviously about me, but not about me in a literal way, I'm able to have a kind of radical honesty. And so I trust my fiction much, much more than I trust my, my nonfiction. Until <laughs> now, I think, until now. I, what grief did to me, when I started writing about um, what I was feeling after my father died, I, I don't think, I, I didn't necessarily plan to have it published. I remember thinking I was writing it for myself and for my siblings. Um, but at some point in the writing process, I think I decided that I wanted to have it published. And I think partly it was because in those early stages of grief, when I was still in, in a kind of denial, but at the same time, I wanted to let the world know about my father. I wanted to celebrate him. I wanted to say, I wanted to shout out, I was raised by this wonderful man. And now they're telling me he's gone. I mean, really, that, that was the... The, the kind of impetus to wanting to publish it. But, but even making that decision did not make me then close up or become measured. 
I think grief just really, I mean, again, it's that idea of being undone. I, I felt mm -hmm. like a different person. I feel like a different person. Yeah. And, and that different person, you know, in some ways, and, and, and this is going to sound very, um, to put it very bluntly, like I really don't give a, I just, I, there's just a, a kind of openness, a rawness. This terrible thing has happened to me. You know, what is one to hide? Why should one hide? Um, and most of all, I think also honesty in situations of that sort, I think is, is really imperative. And if I'm going to help someone by talking about my grief, the most I can do is to be fully honest about it because otherwise there's no point, especially a, so there's nothing like grief. There's nothing like losing a person you adore. There's nothing like that. And, um, and so I think it calls for, it calls for a kind of permanence in, in any kind of change that happens to you. So no, I just, you know, I wrote it. I just, I just wrote. And um, because it was first published in the New Yorker and, you know, and I sent it off and I just thought, no, I'm not changing anything. No, I don't want to hold anything back. No, this is it. You know, that, that that's, you know, I'm done. <laughs> and, and I still feel that way. That radical honesty, that's bold. That's bold in this moment where it is dangerous. It is dangerous where, in fact, the moment we're in calls for, I think, being more measured than perhaps we may have ever have had to be. Um, as a creative, as a writer, as, as a deep critical thinker who understands and appreciates both the importance of exposing the self in this radically honest way, but also who perhaps also understands um, the critical moment that we're in that requires us to be perhaps a bit more controlled in our commentary. How, for lack of a better way of putting it, has cancellation culture encouraged you to hold on to that radical honesty with ever greater force or perhaps to pull back a little? No, I, I think it's the, um, I think it's the former, certainly not the latter. It's. <laughs> I think my reaction to um, and 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 I should say that, that there's a part of me that um, and this is the complexity of this kind of um, conversation that even the language one then feels a bit uncomfortable. So that expression "cancel culture" I don't really like to use, and the reason is that I think it has been co-opted by kind of the political right in this country, which is um, which is not a tribe I aligned with, <laughs> and so. There's a sense in which using that language, one then kind of wants to say, well, I'm using it, but I want you to know that I'm not using it in the way that this group uses it. So even that becomes very complicated. But but I, what I would maybe call it is um, this kind of quickness to, to censor people, this lack of um, the assumption of good faith in conversations, um, and also the, the death of nuance. And... Yeah. It, it makes me, it really worries me, right? And I think it worries me because it seems to, um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I think in some ways when I'm, when I'm being very generous in my thinking, which is not always, <laughs> I think the root of it is well-meaning. I think this idea came from this, um, that we need to be more sensitive about really people. And it's something I, I subscribe to and I believe very much in. But I think it's very easy to go from that to then saying, you need to censor yourself and really to the death of thinking. And I worry about what it's going to do for cultural production. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I'll give an example. Being told, for, for example, that um, many publishers now have what they call sensitivity readers yes. just really worries me. And it worries me as a person who believes deeply that art has to come from a place of art has to come from a place of a kind of textured um messiness mm -hmm. you know when i when i read fiction and i'm a person who deeply loves to read fiction if it seems too ideologically correct it doesn't feel like art it doesn't feel like life because life is not ideologically correct 
you know, I mean, if I had to write about my own life fictionally, I'm a person who believes very much, I mean, clearly in equality of men and women. I feel very strongly about racial equality. Um, but if I had to write about myself, I would have to also indict myself in places where I have found myself questioning whether I am misogynistic, for example, where I have found myself questioning myself for, um, for not living up to the ideals that I believe in. And that's what art should do, right? Art should kind of make us uncomfortable. Art should show us the ways that we are beautiful and the ways that we are flawed. And I think if we step from a place of self-censorship, a place of kind of perfection, which is really in the end what this, this idea of canceling people is about, is that we, we're asking people to be perfect. And I think art goes against that in every possible way. I start off with the flawedness of our humanity but also the possibility in that flawedness, that we are beautiful, that we are capable of good, but we're not perfect. And, and so I find myself really, really resistant to this, um, you know, someone says something the wrong way, that person is canceled, that person needs to lose their job, um, you know, and, and social media is so toxic. I was just reading about a woman whose address was put out there because she had said something the wrong way. And so really what, you're, what what's happening is that she's being put at risk. Um, and I, I just, you know, it, it really makes me even more determined, um, much more determined to be what I've always been, which is a person who I'm very willing to learn, to change my mind, to grow, but I can think for myself, you know, I can. And I have to say that as a woman, um, and from the time I was a little girl, this is something that I have fiercely stood for, which is I can think for myself. Do not tell me what to think <laughs> and do not tell me what to say. Um, and it seems that now it's, it's happening on a grand scale where I'm thinking, no, 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 nobody tell me what to think. But at the same time, I, I'm very willing to do the work. I want to, if there's something I don't understand, I want to go learn about it. But, but at the same time, I think I reserve for myself the right to resist. I'm struck by the recurring theme of the mother-daughter relationship in African literature. But what your essay unfolds is this remarkable beauty and power to the unique relationship between a daughter and her father, a father and his daughter. I wonder if you could speak to how you um, imagine and, and feel or sense the importance of that relationship now in your own role as a mother, um, raising a daughter uh, with a husband and seeing that relationship replicated in a very intimate way, I imagine. Oh, yeah, I am, um, you know, honestly, one of the things that I'm so grateful that my, um, that my daughter knew her grandfather. Mm -hmm. And now when it's, uh, um, for her bedtime, I've made up a song and it's Inigo. And it's um, it's a song because I want her to remember what her grandparents called her. Mm -hmm. So the song goes, um, Grandpa na ogi zi wongwa, Grandma na ogi asamwa. So you know, your grandfather called you good child, your grandmother called you beautiful child. And so she goes to sleep listening to this pretty much every night. Um, and, and obviously, <laughs> I think there's a part of me that feels that maybe one of the reasons I married my husband is that he's kind of like my father. I did not realize this at the time. It was not obvious, I don't think, but there's a lot about him that's like my father for good and bad. <laughs> and, um, and I see his relationship with my daughter and it just warms my heart because I look at them and I think I had this, I had this, um, you know, just this feeling of feeling completely safe in the love of a parent. And um, yeah, so my, my, my daughter, I think one of the, I mean, I, I hope that I will give her as well what I got from my parents, which is just this confidence and room to be who you are. And I think in the time of my parents, and this is something I, I, I'm so grateful to them for, it was a bit unusual, right? My, my father was born in 1932. My mother was born in 1942. For that time and place, they had a level of progressiveness that was not really the norm. Mm -hmm. And so to have their third daughter, me, be a bit strange, a bit different, and to allow me to be 
you know, you have a third daughter who gets into medical school, which is really difficult to do. And then she one day just announces to you, I want to leave. And then you don't go crazy and tell her she's mad. You just tell her, are you sure? And then you support her. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just not really usual. And when I was growing up, my mother, my mother raised me with a kind of trust where I didn't feel the need to lie about things that many of my friends had to lie about with their parents. Mm -hmm. um, I remember in secondary school where, where there was a boy I liked and my mother said, no, he needs to come see you at home, right? You don't need to go off. No, he needs to come to the house. So, <laughs> so, so the boy would come to the house and would sit in the living room and everybody kind of knew. And this was not done when I was growing up. My friends all had to sort of sneak around and lie about the boys they liked. And so I hope to give that to my daughter and right? to um, this kind of, you know, to be a parent, not a friend, because zero, to be a parent, but to give her the kind of confidence to, to, to come into her own. Absolutely. You know, I um, can't help but to think about another recurring theme in your work, and that is the importance, the power, the influence of the visual arts of Africa. You know, we start with purple hibiscus and there are the figurines. And then we, we move throughout and we land, in this case, um, in half of a yellow sun with Richard, who is infatuated with these uh, bronzes. And uh, I wonder your thoughts about the present moment in the African art world, the literary arts with the um, uh, Nobel laureate now being, uh, for literature, now being Abdul Razak Gurna. And this moment of conversation and actuality in some instances of the repatriation of uh, African art objects. Are we in a moment of a renaissance? Is this a high point? Is this, how would you articulate, how would you describe this particular moment in terms of the arts of Africa? Uh, we're at a high point. I don't know. It seems to me that I don't know every sort of six or seven years we wonder are we at a high point and then it's fair and we go back and we think yeah we had a high point i don't know if we had a high point i think i think there's much more that could be done i mean obviously i feel very strongly about on, on the subject of um african art that was illegally taken that actually was stolen from the continent and is now in various museums in europe and we have to pay money to go look at things that our great grandfathers and great grandmothers made um I find just very strange. So I feel very strongly about, um, and not, not just about conversations, which I'm, I feel very strongly about action. Um, so yes, I do think, for example, that the Benin bronzes belong in Benin. Um, but in a larger sense, I'm, I find I'm very excited about what's going on in terms of just cultural production on the continent. Um, I'm very interested in the visual arts. I, I just love, and, and, and for me, it's just a, I like to say that for me, visual arts and paintings and you know, visual arts exist as, as um, sources of joy for me. So, so to have something on my wall is to look at it and just be happy. <laughs> and um, so the young African artists that I admire very much and follow, the, um, and, and some of the, so someone like Victor Hikameno is a yeah. who's also a dear friend of mine, but that's not the reason I love his work. <laughs> I think he's just so. I mean, he's just he's so. You know, he's he's having a conversation with our history, yes. and I find that so beautiful. Victor is so, you know, really invested in a in a deeply true and emotional way yeah. in talking in in just in our history, where we've come from, who we are. And I love that. Um, there are other, you know, young artists who there's a there's a young Nigerian woman, um, Antonia Neji, who just mm -hmm. does this really bright bursts of color and, and female figures. And, yes. and for me, it's a kind of celebration of, of, of just that wonderful femaleness. And there's just so much that's exciting about um, the art that's happening in Nigeria, but also I think in, in Africa. Um, and I kind of like to think of of the various art forms being in conversation with one another. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when my writing is not going well, I, maybe I fool myself, but I, I try to look at paintings because I hope that somehow they will help me get my words back or something. Yes, it's, 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 it's really, isn't it? That, that moment where when we start to talk about the unspeakable things, that the visual 
can capture us and carry us forward and enable us to find a way to articulate that, which is so so difficult to find the words for. I, um, you know, I just, I want to say uh, as we wrap up a personal note of thanks. Uh, you know, in 1996, I lost my father suddenly, unimaginably, and could not begin to find the words to describe the sense of loss. And as I read through your book and as I listened to the audio version again and again, I kept thinking, how can she write my feelings? How can she tell my story? How is she able, you know, we're 20 plus years removed from the date of the passing of my father. And yet I found in your work a sort of release a sort of freedom, a sort of expression that immediately resonated. And I know if it resonated with me, that it has resonated with so, 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 so many out there. So Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, thank you, thank you, thank you for this newest work of yours, which gives a language that some of us never even had the capacity to even know to reach for. But thank you also for all of your work, for all of you are, and for that fierce, radical honesty to which you hold on to and inspire through it um, all of us to do the same, to preserve that radical honesty for the betterment of our humanity. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa. And can I just say it's always such a joy to know that one's work has been read with care and with thoughtfulness. That's the best gift a writer can get. And so thank you for giving me that gift today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.